our domination and use of other animals on this planet is one of the root causes and fundamental issues underlying so many of the problems facing the planet today that it will have incredible benefits when more people and hopefully the whole world eventually adopt a, a vegan lifestyle. Anyway, today I want to talk about this question of whether or not veganism is actually sustainable for the entire population and the whole world to follow. So let's get into it. Hey friends, Serena here. Welcome back to my channel. And for those of you that are new, I have been vegan since birth. On this channel, I talk about growing up vegan and all things related to veganism, answering any questions you might have. Today's topic is the issue of sustainability, and I'm going to address several overarching claims that are often brought up regarding whether or not veganism is sustainable in terms of a diet that can sustain people healthfully for a long time, and environmentally, and whether or not we can actually feed the whole population only eating plants. So the first thing I want to discuss is whether or not vegan diets are healthfully sustainable for the whole population. When we look at the populations around the world that are the longest lived and most health, health, most healthful in general, these are something we call the blue zones. And there have been a lot of research done on the blue zones, which are five communities around the world where people regularly live to a hundred years old or longer. And they have a larger proportion of centenarians than pretty much any other community on the planet. And these five populations are in Loma Linda, California, uh, Sardinia, Italy, there's a location in Greece, Costa Rica, and Okinawa, Japan. And what researchers have found across these populations is that by and large, they all ate predominantly plant-based diets. This was the main theme running through these different communities. Not 100% vegan, but predominantly plant-based. And by predominantly, most of them ate five or fewer servings of meat in an entire month. And those servings they did eat were usually in the order of several ounces. So this is an incredibly, incredibly small amount of animal protein or meat that these populations were consuming. They also found that they all ate high levels of legumes, lots of soy, peas, beans, lentils, and that overall, that, uh, there's a lot of other factors, right? But that those were the common themes in, a, in terms of diet. There were also lifestyle and other factors. But anyway, all this to say that there really is no question that eating predominantly plant-based diets are the most healthful thing for people to live long, active lives. And all of our science and other research backs this up as well. Plus, Look at me. I've been vegan my entire life and I know many other 20, 30, even 40 year vegans that are thriving eating only plants. But anyway, the second claim that frequently gets brought up when talking about sustainability is the issue of do we actually have enough land to grow food to feed the entire world plants only? And what a lot of people I've found are worried about is that things like lettuce or celery or these vegetables have so many fewer calories compared to uh, you know, a steak or a piece of meat or flesh that we'd have to, the idea is they think we'd have to use a lot more land to grow a lot more vegetables to feed people around the world. However, this is just honestly kind of naive and not in, uh, and not in line with the reality. And the reality is that we are using massive amounts of land and resources to grow grain and commodity crops to feed to animals right now. And that land could all be converted to growing grain and vegetables to feed directly to people, and it would actually free up immense amounts of land. A 2018 study that was one of the most comprehensive studies looking at over 37,000 different farms found that even the most environmentally impactful vegetables created fewer greenhouse gas emissions, used less water, less land, and were generally better for the environment as a whole than even the least impactful animal-based foods. Estimates right now suggest that we have about 100 billion land animals that are being raised uh, and, and killed every year. This doesn't count fishes, which are up in the trillions, and cows alone, about 10 billion, 
And cows eat so much more in terms of pure calories than humans do. If we can feed over 10 billion cows every single year on this planet, there's absolutely no reason that we can't feed 7 or 8 billion or 10 billion people eating plants. So why is raising animals for food so incredibly inefficient? Because basically what's happening when we grow land, when we use land, when we use water, when we raise any animals and then slaughter them for food, we are cycling nutrients through a third, basically through a, a, a middle party. In ecology, there's something we talk about called trophic levels, where each level going from producers, which are the plants that actually take the sun's energy via photosynthesis and convert it into energy, and then going, so they're the producers, and then rising up the level into consumers that are small herbivores to secondary consumers, they're the animals that eat small herbivores, up to tertiary um, consumers who are the vultures, they're, they're the, the carnivores, more at the top of the food chain. Every single level we rise up the trophic level, there is basically a 10% rule, which is that only 10% of energy gets actually converted and carried on through the system, whereas 90% of it is lost and is inefficient. So the lower down on the food chain we eat, the lower down humans are on the food chain, the more efficient and conserving of the sun's energy in the first place, which is where all of our food and nutrients are essentially coming from, uh, the more efficient that entire process is and the more people or animals or whoever can be fed. And I hear a lot that humans are at the top of the food chain, which is actually biologically not correct. We have used our technology to basically make ourselves at the top of the food chain today, but historically we, we were not at the top, right? We are, you know, more orbivorous when we look at our teeth, when we look at our fingernails and our biological structure. And carnivores, right, panthers, bears, there's these other creatures that naturally would have actually been our predators, but we have hunted them to extinction, overtaken the planet with our cities, and then we've gone and made it worse by breeding and raising animals and like cows and pigs and chickens into existence to also uh, consume. So anyway, long story short is if we took all of the land and water that we are raising animals on and, you know, for two years a cow has to grow up and eat grain and graze on grass and drink tons of water in that time, to then be killed and produce a relatively small amount of calories and protein from their flesh, when for two years we could have been using that land to cultivate vegetables and crops that produce way more calories, way more protein, way more nutrients, and energy that we could feed directly to people. A 2016 study found that if we were to convert the land that we are using to raise beef cows right now, if we were to use that to grow other plant-based proteins, specifically legumes, that we could feed an additional 190 million people simply by converting that beef producing land into legume producing land. So, Short story is, yes, we absolutely have enough land and cutting out animal agriculture or massively lowering the amount of animal agriculture going on would free up land and make it more possible to sustainably feed the entire population. Okay, but what about things like nuts, cashews, almonds, avocados, and quinoa? Things that vegans are eating a lot of right now and they're not sustainable. Well. It's time to put that one to rest. First of all, this is not a vegan issue. Vegans are not the only people that eat chocolate or that eat cashews or that eat quinoa. And these are commodity crops that have grown in popularity among many different communities. And most of this is actually a myth. For example, almonds got a pretty bad rep in California for needing lots of water. However, when you look at the state's data on what is actually consuming California's water, it's actually beef. Beef and dairy cows by far use about 50% of the entire state of California's water supply, yet produce only about 1% of the world's beef. Whereas California is producing around 90% of the world's almond supply and uses a fraction of the amount of water that the beef industry in California does. An average 1,200 pound female dairy cow that is lactating will drink on average between 25 to 30 gallons of water per day. Over an entire year, that ends up equaling approximately 10,000 gallons of water for a single cow. 
And just think, how many people could be actually drinking that water? How many vegetables, how many grains and produce could we be producing if we use that water to water our fields and give to people instead of that single cow? So this is really a misnomer and kind of something that has really been perpetuated by the animal agriculture and, and animal agribusiness industries themselves to kind of deflect pressure from them and try and point the finger back at vegans who are trying to live more ethically and sustainably and they want to poke holes in our logic. During the Climate Diet Summit that I hosted back in April, one of the people we interviewed for that was Miyoko Shinner, the CEO and founder of Miyoko's Kitchen who produces a lot of really incredible plant-based dairy alternatives and many of her products are from cashews. And she actually described to us how what's not taken into account when people mention how much, you know, water, for example, cashews or almonds need is that they are trees that are being fed by rainwater in a jungle in most cases, whereas cows were actually having to import or drain fresh water to give them water. So, so we look at, you know, how much water it takes to produce cashews, but that water is largely coming from natural sources such as rainfall and not something that we are actually having to do. So it is actually quite uh, efficient. And when we talk about water in particular, a lot of things get really skewed and it really is important to distinguish whether that is water inputs of us directly like watering and needing to provide water or whether that is naturally coming from rainfall. And when it comes to things like quinoa or rice or these other commodity crops, there are lots of questions around them. And, and it's true. A lot of our agricultural practices right now, whether vegan or not, are horrible. Lots of the herbicides and pesticides and tilling and the way we are treating our land and topsoil is atrocious. But the thing we have to remember is that the majority of our land, including crops and things like soy and corn, are being grown with those methods to feed animals. And if we stopped raising animals, we wouldn't need to use as much land or anywhere close to the amount we're using now to grow those crops. And the crops that we do grow, we can then work to improve the sustainability and practices to make them more ecologically friendly. And there are a lot of people doing this work right now with veganic agriculture, which is basically a combination of vegan and organic. So it's vegan in that it's not using bone and blood meal or fertilizer and manure coming from animals. It's not using pesticides and herbicides from the petroleum industry because it's organic. So it's combining the best of both worlds and there are a lot of people showing incredible results and farming in these veganic, restorative, regenerative methods that both eliminate animal exploitation and the harmful pesticides and farming and industrial farming practices. So it is entirely possible that is the direction we should be moving and 100% we can feed the world on plants. Okay, so we've covered all of that, but what about grazing? Isn't there some land, you know, that uh, isn't suitable for growing crops and animals are much more efficient in grazing them on that land and then getting a little bit of meat, milk, eggs, or dairy from them? Again. This is a giant fallacy because not all land in the world has to be grazed or used to grow crops in the first place. We are using so much land, especially like the Brazilian Amazon where we're cutting down forests to make land to graze cattle where that is not naturally what that land is designed for at all. That's, that's what we're doing right now, okay? We don't have to use all the land out there to grow food. There is plenty of arable land right now that is being destroyed by overgrazing, excessive grazing, deforestation, all of this. And we could just be using the existing farming land and produce more than enough food to feed the entire world so that we don't have to take these small little plots of land that supposedly can't grow crops and do anything with them. We can let more land rewild, return to the natural forests and grasslands that they once were. Anyway, give this video a big thumbs up if you enjoyed it, and please let me know in the comments below what else you would like me to talk about, and I will see you next week.